All right, guys. Hi. I'm Sebastian. I am a, a member of a DeadCraft team. And I'm going to introduce you um, a tool which we call DIT. It's a decentralized version of a prominent Git client. So who of you guys is an active developer? Wonderful. Who of you is familiar with Git? Perfect. So then you're, you're, you're the uh, right target group to introduce you a decentralized version um, of exactly this kind of client. And the reason why we came up with the idea that the world needs a decentralized Git client is effectively that we at DitCraft believe in DAOs. Have you guys heard about DAOs? Yes. Okay, good. So, fortunately, I have some slides where I'm going to introduce you what the meaning of a DAO is. But effectively, a DAO is nothing else than the idea of lifting the blockchain pre principles of decentralization, of uh, democracy, of uh, incentivization to the next level. And the next level is where we, the humans, are, the people. Um, and I think that DAOs have, in particular, a lot of uh, value to add when it comes to software development. So enough teased. Let's dive a bit more into the details. So, as mentioned, the big buzzword in the blockchain community these days is a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and the idea is of a DAO actually boil down to the fact that whatever we learned from blockchain networks, namely that nodes can freely you know, come and go, participate in a consensus protocol and just agree on the next stage of common truth, um, this principle you know, could be effectively lifted to a lot of applications where we humans you know, also participate in a consensus. Um, and we at DidCraft at some point started to think, okay, a DAO is actually a wonderful concept. You know, a lot of people talk about that, but let's build it. Yeah, let's build it. And then we start, started to figure out that actually, ooh, what is actually a DAO? Yeah. So a DAO could, for example, be, you know, a family, you know, where... Um, all members of the family just, you know, try to do their own things. But still, you know, because we're a family, we need to reach a consensus and agree, for example, what we're going to do today or tomorrow, what we're going to eat, whatever. Then a European Union is also a great example for a DAO. We have like a lot of countries, you know, which belong uh, to the member countries of the European Unions. All of them function standalone. But the European Union is just some kind of framework, like a DAO framework, that you know, puts all those countries, say, in one union, and then they democratically decide what is good, say, for the European Union. Uh, when we talk about the DAO, we're actually interested, of course, in software. Yeah? So the question is, how can we build an decentralized, incentivized and uh, democratic way software yeah so we're rather trying to look you know at the googles but uh, rather from a decentralized autonomous uh, point of view um, and this is the mission of didcraft so we're building um, the tools in order to make the idea that at some point you know all the developers so most of you guys here can at some point, you know, contribute with your code to an organization, and this will, be, of course, be valued and appreciated. Yeah. And um, some people started to define, you know, how one could build a DAO. So there is a lot of, you know, discussions going on, and I think uh, soon in a month there's going to be blockchain week here in Berlin, and I think the w number one topic will be how to build DAOs. So from our point of view, a DAO is nothing else than a standard, say, funnel of software development. And 
start uh, from the bottom up. So normally, when we build software, we develop, uh, we code, and ideally, we test our code. Uh, prior to that, of course, we design what we want to implement. So we design maybe an architecture or an algorithm, whatever it needs. And prior to that, in the final, we of course, first of all, uh, analyze the requirements you know, our software should realize. And in order to do that, of course, we need you know, some kind of resources. So either we do it you know, as a full-time developer for a company, we're freelancers, or we are you know, lucky that we received some kind of grants in order you know, to implement the software we, uh, we are interested in. Um, so this is the standard you know, funnel which is necessary in order to build software. And when we, for example, achieve to decentralize this process, then something magical might happen. Um, yeah, okay, forget that. Good. So, I mean, we're developing software for uh, years. Um, why should we change something? Why is there, you know, up of something different. Do you guys have, maybe from your experiences, any ideas what goes wrong these days, maybe with open source development? Say again? Burnout. Burnout! <laughs> Tell us more. Okay. Uh, maintainers getting too many questions, too many requests, but they do get in their spare time. Uh, they, they have a job, All right. they can't maintain it properly, maybe it's used by thousands of projects, yeah. and there's a problem, but they don't have time to fix yeah. it. Okay. Other problems you guys are having? Security. Security, ah, good point. Because, I mean, there's been incidents where the handover to the code to a new maintainer was a bad idea, respectively, yeah. or, yeah. uh, or just... So, so Heartbleed is, I think, a wonderful example, right? That um, the maintainer didn't really check the contribution of the Heartbleed feature, and then it turned out in one of the biggest security disasters, I think, uh, of that century, I would call it. <laughs> okay? Okay. So let me start with... a controversial statement, I believe that coding these days is male-governed. And, you know, male-governed means that, for example, there's only one project owner that, you know, has to do all the hard work. Yeah? Um, and a great example is this guy. I mean, don't get me wrong, I really like that, him. He did a lot, but we all of us also know that he's a very special project maintainer, project owner, right? Um, and this is really a quote that he apologizes you know, for being you know, such an asshole within the last decades, uh, because he was really, you know, I think, killing a lot of good feature ideas because they didn't comply with his vision how the Linux kernel should look like. Um, and... You know, this kind of centralized project ownership, you know, not only leads, you know, to um, burnouts or security vulnerabilities, but it also sometimes leads, you know, to the development of a very good pr um, project, but unfortunately, you know, in the wrong direction. Yeah. So there, uh, there have been a lot of examples uh, with the Linux kernels that people suggested really good features, um, but he just blocked them. Um, another problem, I think, uh, today is that coding is um, uh, misincentivized. I think, uh, you know, a lot of uh, you people just, you know, program in your spare time, you know, put a lot of uh, passion into your ideas. But at some point, you know, those I good ideas turn maybe into something really, really cool. Um, a good example, I think, is the Mozilla project. Yeah, so those guys really did, you know, something great. You know, back in the days, they came up with a wonderful browser. But at some point, there was another company, Google, 
that came up with the idea, ah, we need our own browser. And do you guys know this uh, story, how it started, with what kind of code? Hmm? Yeah, and what is within Safari? Yeah. So I'm not sure whether it's Safari, because I remember that they used a lot of uh, features from the Mozilla project. So, for example, the whole uh, web rendering um, packages, they have been taken from Mozilla. In Chrome, hmm? is Chrome is, is, is Mozilla code? Yeah. Make any sense. It used to be which, by the way, used to be Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. But anyways, so the problem is, you know, what, uh, the pr problem I want to mention here is uh, the problem which is called the browser battle. Yeah. So there used to be this wonderful open source project. Then at some point, you know, a competitor came up. And he reached more and more uh, market uh, shares. Uh, right now, I think Google is, I think, um, having most market shares among all bra um, browsers. And um, one of the reasons, and I mean, just you know, uh, Google, ironically, you know, for that article, it really you know uh, gives some kind of clues that uh, Google you know, continuously made life harder for Mozilla, and they conjecture that that's one of the reasons why, for example, Mozilla just you know, uh, lost more and more market shares. Yeah? So my point is that you know, due to the fact that at some point good ideas you know, that you know, have been incubated in the open source community have been you know, taken and then you know, uh, commercialized, with the consequence that now people that contributed to this open source project um, yeah, suffer from. Good. Um, so these ha have been just you know, so some problems with existing, um, or at least from our point of view, with the way um, software and open source software is developed these days. Um, so let's start to think, you know, how can we, you know, change the situation using principles of a DAO. And the basic principle of a DAO is that no one really owns the project. It's the community that owns the project. Yeah. So there is no centralized project owner. And in order to reach that, we need also that kind of consensus protocol. And this consensus protocol... So... Uh, what we need in order to now decentralize project ownership is, as mentioned, a consensus protocol. And this consensus protocol among humans is normally referred as a voting protocol. Um, implementing voting protocols on, say, a blockchain network is actually not that trivial. Um, so the de facto voting protocol um, in the Ethereum community is something which I call the one stake, one vote protocol. Have you guys heard about that? Okay. So let me show you how it works. So um, it works that every voter stakes some kind of tokens. Maybe some ETH. Um, then a quorum is decided um, and the majority, so the winners of a decision, you know, slash the stake of the losers. And the idea behind this protocol is that, you know, um, it's game theoretic, which means that, you know, we assume that all voters are, of course, interested in uh, maximizing the utility, which means maximize their number of tokens. So whenever they contribute with their vote to something, they don't want to lose, lose their stake. So th this is the main idea behind that protocol. Um, does anybody of you also have an idea what is the weakness of this protocol? And... Collusion? Collusion? Um, 
And what is the intention of collusion? Uh, still, okay. Yeah, so uh, if, <laughs> if I'm going to vote on a feature, uh, I'd rather make, like, I'd rather be sure that I'm not losing my coins, right? So I'm probably going to do a lot of politics outside of the voting. I mean, politics is always part of voting. Right, <laughs> yes. Okay, the other thing I, I was wondering is what if you don't vote at all? If I decide to, if no one... Uh... Yeah, but let's assume you nevertheless want to vote, but ideally, you know, the attack would be that you would like to bias the outcome of, of the vote, right? How can you do that? What kind of extra power do you need? It's, a, it's also the standard problem of proof, or the fear with proof of stake protocols in general that if there is a party that is overly rich, it can easily bias the outcome of an election yeah, simply by just outstaking all others. Yeah? A very, very simple attack. And as simple as this attack uh, might sound, it also happened recently uh, in an arrogant voting. Yeah. So um, there have been um, yeah, examples where in the last second there was one guy uh, who just you know, outnumbered in particular questions and particular proposals all others. Yeah. And this is a severe problem you know, to this consensus mechanism. So, what we then thought, can we do something better? Something which really, you know, uh, meets, say, the spirit of a community, uh, in particular the, say, open source or blockchain community. Can we design a protocol which also allows us to reach consensus, but maybe which is not based on wealth, but on something different? And this something different is knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge is something which I think one has you know, to somehow acquire over time. Well, it's not possible to buy knowledge, say, on an exchange. Uh, it's also independent of, say, your origin. It doesn't matter whether you have been a rich kid or not. Knowledge is really something which I think is more suitable to decide on very important questions. For example, very specific questions which actually only knowledgeable people, which are normally experts in a very particular field, should decide on. So we came up with a new voting protocol. Um, and it works very similar to that first protocol I showed you guys, so that kind of staking protocol. Uh, but here the difference is that, first of all, everybody, every voter, proposes um, with the same amount of stake. So all the golden coins, is, this is for example EVE. So all of the players stake first of all the same amount of collateral. And now the difference is that uh, we introduce a second token, which we call the knowledge token. And this token is something which you can only acquire by participating in elections. By participating, for example, in votings, which you know, define, for example, is that a good feature or is that a bad feature? Or is this good code? Yeah. So we mentioned that, for example, code testing is like a huge problem. Yeah. So for example, you know, only if you, for example, proved that you validated enough code and this code was proper, um, you received you know, very special knowledge which is quantified in uh, knowledge tokens. And with that knowledge token, you now can weight your vote. Yeah? So the number of knowledge tokens give you some extra power in the governance of a very particular project or in you know, influencing the decision in a very particular matter. This is the key idea of knowledge extractable voting. Do you guys have questions? Do you can lose uh, knowledge tokens? Of course, you lose knowledge tokens if you lose a voting. Then uh, your knowledge is burned. 
And this is exactly you know, the, the crypto economic incentive beh uh, behind this protocol, where if you assume that knowledge is really like you know, the highest, say, value, valuable token in, an, uh, an, in a DAO, then of course losing knowledge means that, for example, you lose reputation, you lose government's power, you lose, you know, features, for example, like you're, you're not going to get admission to uh, very, very delicate um, um, elections. And you could think about that. And um, the only way to, again, mint knowledge tokens is proving to the community that you do understand what we are talking about. Um, because... You know, you have to, you know, win in those elections. Otherwise, you will never mint, just burn knowledge. Uh, how many, how many tokens, uh, knowledge tokens do you have? Because I can be very good at testing, but not our architecture. Exactly. So there is not a single knowledge token. A knowledge token is something like a label. So, for example, there is a knowledge token for uh, Go. There is a knowledge token for LaTeX. There is a knowledge token for... Uh, HTML, and uh, whenever you uh, define an election, you know, of, um, the community defines what kind of, say, knowledge tokens, you know, characterize this project. And then you need to vote for the knowledge token, knowledge label. How do you, how do you define this label? Who de defined yeah. that? So right now, we just you know, made it simple. So we defined, I think, 10 or 15 knowledge tokens, which are predefined. Uh, but in an ideal DAO, the community itself would, first of all, define you know, what, what are, say, the important knowledge tokens for this project. Yeah? But in the current imp implementation, we just you know, selected some prominent ones. Hi, um, thanks. I really like this idea of quantifying knowledge. Thank because, you. I mean, money by itself is not why we are doing this, right? No. Um, I would, I mean, as much as you can share, I would love to learn more because I find it difficult to imagine how you're actually going to quantify knowledge without being corruptible, without being maybe able to trade knowledge tokens for Ethereum. You know, I could imagine all those kind of things. I've never yet found something where yeah. everybody is anonymous and you can still validate that this person has done a certain thing, has okay. proven a certain knowledge. Exactly. Please elaborate, yeah. Wonderful question. And uh, exactly those kind of questions have been inspir the inspiration for this protocol. Um, so first of all, let me answer the, the simple question. Why, why can't you, for example, trade knowledge tokens? And that's the beauty of, say, the Ethereum uh, network, that you can define smart contracts in such a way that you don't have the ability to define whether you want to, for example, transfer your knowledge tokens to someone, you know, buy them on an exchange. So this is not implemented. Uh, yeah, I had a question, uh, but also a comment on, the, on that. Uh just because you can't transfer the token doesn't mean you can't sell your private key, so, but that's a different topic. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could uh, explain like a little bit, like, the actual, you, you, like you haven't actually explained really uh, the use cases and what people would be voting on. Like ideally, like in my projects, I prefer as little voting as possible. Like you usually only just do it to, like, to you know, resolve a dispute, but there shouldn't be like disputes every day. Like you don't want to go voting every day on something you're working on, right? So maybe okay. you could explain a little bit, like okay. what you envision this to be used for in okay. day-to-day -day development. Yeah, um, comes in one two slides. Okay, let's go back to the original idea of uh, knowledge. So y you could definitely share um, uh, or sell your private key, but this way you would give away, say, your whole reputation, right? I mean, you're absolutely right. Everything is anonymous, yeah, and uh, no one can really tell, you know, who is who. Absolutely possible. Um, but normally, you know, and here is again the kind of say game theoretic uh, incentive argumentation that you build over your time, you know, something like your reputation in terms of knowledge tokens. This gives you some kind of extra power in the DAO. Yeah, because you know, your vo uh, voting uh, votes 
weight more than maybe people that recently started. It's quite comparable to a computer game, right? So in the beginning, in the first level, you're weak, but you know, after you know, spending hundreds and thousands of hours and you know, training your character, moving to the next level, next level, next level, you of course get more powerful. And then the idea is that selling now so your, your character and starting from scratch is, um, is disincentivizing people. Another feature we implemented is that we have something like a small KYC, which you know, links um, um, profiles with um, a Twitter account. Because um, this way we want to uh, pre uh, prevent that, for example, people clone their identities and you know, just you know, create multiple profiles. And this way, you know, maximize this strategy, as you mentioned, you know, that you know, I train some profiles get, and make sure that they have a decent amount of knowledge and then sell them on an eBay marketplace and so on, right? In order to avoid that, you know, you're effectively only able to do have one profile and you need to decide whether you want to sell it or not. I mean, just, just as a comment, I mean, I don't think with, with Ethereum that would, be that would be possible to do, but something like a network of trust is usually used in that kind of situations yeah, where you say, trust, even definitely. if I train a thousand profiles that are all like highly skilled or have a lot of knowledge tokens, if they don't refer to anything outside, it would be like a bubble and would rate it down. While if you have incoming trust from many parties from around the world or from different communities that are trusted from other communities. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, Web of Is that trust. something that would be feasible? I'm not sure if I understand technologically if that would be possible, but that could kind of <laughs> yeah. increase the value or represent it. Yeah. I mean, we, we try to s somehow reach uh, a similar goal, like the goal of Web of Trust, by you know, linking... Um, Eve addresses to a very particular uh, profile, namely that of a Twitter account. Um, but, say, in the next, say, iterations, it would definitely make sense to also, you know, decentralize that, that say, authentication service or that KYC service. I totally get your point, yeah. But uh, we just you know, started some months ago, so we cannot provide you a super-duper perfect solution. So actually, the reason why I'm here and I'm presenting to you guys is because I very much solicite those discussions, this feedback, and inspiration for maybe you know, implementing the right features. Because uh, the decentralized Git you know, is effectively a to uh, tool for the community, for you guys. You know, we're not having, you know, any commercial interests. It's really, you know, uh, we would like to understand whether principles, you know, of decentralization, incentivization, you know, could be transferred to our daily life of software development. Yeah? And that's why, you know, I'm here, and I'm very happy to, you know, get those uh, fruitful discussions. So we definitely need to drink some beers offline. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I apologize if this is a very specific question, but I've been watching this loop for a while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and after the vote is decided, the loser's stake is divided amongst the winners. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if you've given thought to the rules on that last step. Yeah. Like so if I put all my there stuff is in. some math formula behind, and the idea is that um, you use you know some kind of quadratic factor you know of the knowledge tokens multiplied by um, the stake you give in. Okay, this is something we can catch up on. Yeah, but this is definitely yeah. a, a second beer. <laughs> and I hope I still get the for formula together. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of questions. So first, if I am a developer, like let's say, okay, I'm working for Google, I have a C++ background, <laughs> so I have a lot of C++ tokens. I decide to you know, poison Mozilla. They also, I mean, okay, they're switching to Rust, but they have a big C++ code base. So I can overrule everybody because I have a lot of tokens, um, like of C++ tokens. How do you prevent from, from switching? Second question, uh, you say this is not, it's not clear to me why uh, it wouldn't be the same problem as uh, the rich gets richer because what I can do, uh, I can, just spread all my tokens into many accounts. 
Uh, yes, if it's connected okay. to a Twitter account, it's just a script away from being a, from not being a problem. Uh, so I still see the rich get richer. Maybe, you know, at a slower pace, but you still because. The, the decision will be spread among all I my mean, fake accounts. Something, something that we will never prevent is, for example, that I start with, say, 10 profiles, you know, 10 accounts, and then I tra train them continuously. So right now, say, the only um, protection mechanism we have implemented is that we do something like a KYC, so we just really want to make sure that the guy, you know, who is behind that EF address has an active, say, Twitter profile and shows that he's not a bot. So we, we try to implement, not in a perfect way because everything is not work in progress, but at least the idea is that we would like to do something like a capture test through that KYC. Yeah? In order to exactly prevent that you, know, you have like one real account and 10, 20 bots that work for you, that you know, participate in elections, that of course accumulate knowledge, and this way get more and more powerful. Yeah? So the idea is that through the Twitter KYC, we you know, implement something similar to a capture, and some, uh, this way hope that you know, those automation attacks you have in mind you know, are uh, prevented. Like uh, hijacking Mozilla. Uh, first, yes, what? Like having a lot of C++ tokens taking over another project or making sure another project. Uh, so for example, in uh, there's a big example, uh, leaving me versus FFMP. Yeah. One of them is the fourth of the other. Those guys just had a big fallout and they hate each other's guts. And uh, yeah. So effectively, in that case, you would be killing. What one of the projects would try to kill the other, the other one yeah. retaliates, etc. Et so, my hope is that, and this is the 51% hope, that uh, there is still a large enough, say, um, C community that when they notice that there is this hijacking happening, that at least then they participate in the election and make sure that this kind of hijacking attack doesn't really happen. And the nice thing is, we implemented the burning mechanism um, of knowledge tokens in a very, very radical way. So effectively, you really lose quadratically the number of knowledge tokens. So the math behind this is uh, saying that gaining knowledge is really, really taking a lot of time. But if you really you know, participate in an election where you know you're going to lose, because this is not what the community wants, you know, you, you're going to be punished by, you know, getting a lot of your knowledge burned. Yeah. Um, so it might happen, you know, maybe, you know, at some point that there might is this hijacking attack. But if a community is really uh, online and believing in the whole principle of a DAO, then in that moment, you know, they should really team up, you know, really decide what the community wants. And then... Um, make sure that the Mozilla, uh, you said Mozilla? Uh, yeah. Whoever, right, so will not, you know, uh, hijack any project. Yeah? Good. Um, let's get more into the use cases. Um, so let me first of all tell you what we have implemented. Um, and we went for two directions. So first of all, we developed in a very old school way, a standalone client, like the Git client. But the difference is that the whole protocol, the staking, the labeling, um, you know, everything is, you know, part in our Git client. Um, then we um, also came up with a user interface just in order to make sure or to simplify um, the presentation of existing votes, as well as you know, giving you an, a better overview of how many tokens and what labels you have. Um, and be in mind, the key message is still that if you behave honestly, then you will gain knowledge and you will maximize your uh, stake. But if you're you know a badass you know, then at some point you will lose much of your stake. 
and this way also lose power in the software DAO. Um, there are two versions, so a testnet version, where you can just you know, play standalone uh, uh, with a client, uh, have your elections, and we you know, uh, created you know, three, four bots that will vote randomly for you. This is just you know, for playing, uh, you know, uh, playing with a tool. And then there is a mainnet version where we use the POW network. So where you can um, use you know, uh, XDI tokens and uh, mint uh, mainnet knowledge tokens. Um, good, so the demo. So all the details, so you can call, download um, the client as well get access to, to the explorer um, through either our website or just go to our Twitter account. I would very much appreciate you know, that some of you guys maybe try it out because we want um, you know, your feedback. And what would be a use case just in uh, order to justify why a decentralized version makes more sense? So first of all, I think one of the fundamental problems we mentioned is security. So, and the reason why you know, we have security problems with existing code is that testing you know, sometimes you know, is the last think you know, in the development cycles and uh, time you know, forces us sometimes to really reduce the test cycles to just do it uh, sporadically. With uh, the DIT client, you know, one idea is that uh, maybe the community is more incentivized now you know, to validate certain code contributions. Um, and why should people do it? because you know, they get tokens. And since you know, the introduction of blockchain networks, we know that you know, people like tokens, more or less. Um, then uh, with that um, knowledge token, you would you know, get from participating um, um, in an election, of course, you could quantify yourself. Right? So one of the things which you know, I think the open source community is full of brilliant people, but it's really, really too hard to identify who are the real experts in what field. Knowledge tokens is nothing else than a quantifier. Yeah? We could now come up with rankings, like you know, in a game, uh, where we could define who are, say, the top five uh, developers with that knowledge label. And we could then have really, you know, a community vetted ranking. And th that's a nice thing because knowledge is uh, always, you know, the result of community vetting. Um, so this way, the ranking that would allow us to know, you know, rank developers would also be based on, you know, community uh, values. Um, and I think these are two important features which we believe could help you guys just and having more fun creating code. Um, yep. I think this is um, all from a technical point of view. One thing I would like to just um, you know, throw in the air. So as mentioned, Blockchain uh, Week Berlin is coming soon to town. And uh, we're going to have a meetup um, only dedicated to the question can we somehow change the way software is developed today? And can, in particular, you know, the idea of, say, a DAO influence our daily business? So whoever wants to join, just drop me a line. Um, I think it, it's going to be an amazing meetup. Um, also with you know, some corporates, corporates piggybacking us, because they are also very interested in that topic. Thanks, guys. So please download and let me know what you think.